The, the uh, title of the uh, presentation I'd like to give is called The Value of Awareness. And uh, I, there's no script. There never is a script because I like to engage the audience with questions and things like that. It seems to work really well. I like answering questions because you can hear. Should I talk louder? Yeah. Louder? Oh, okay. He'll turn it up. Okay, so the value of awareness. So in our um, linguistically created world, which means that the words that we use create the perceptions that we have. And if you observe things, which means to look at things with either your energy or your eyes, you'll see things. And when you observe, you discover things through your own direct experience. That's observation. So awareness is something that occurs out of observing. You observe things and you become aware of it. So what is awareness? So does anybody have a definition in their mind of what awareness is? Well, I'd like to point out what it isn't because in this society, we've been thoroughly indoctrinated into um, various perceptions that occur only because of our indoctrination, not because they actually exist, they're illusions. And the definition of illusion is that which exists, but is temporary. So many things that we perceive in this society, and I say this society because that's what we're immersed in. We've all been indoctrinated. We've all been totally ingrained within the things that we believe within this society, and that's the way it is. And it's very difficult to get out of that ingrained belief system because it's so powerful, so strong, and so pervasive. And it, it colors everything we see and do and feel about everything that happens in our world, but it's all an illusion because when you go beyond that illusion, what happens is you see the world as energy and you see it as it really exists and things occur very differently for you when that happens. And it's not something that happens uh, 24 seven and you're always in that state of being, but you can reach that place and uh, uh, at times and over time, you reach that place more and more of the time. So by awareness, what do I mean by awareness? And if I'm talking too fast, let me know, I'll slow down. Um, awareness is to become aware of something. And in this whole realm of awareness, what you're doing is you're trusting your direct experiential experience. You are trusting yourself. Now, who do you trust when you trust yourself? Who are you? You are... What's that three letter word? Dog. Not dog, God. We're God, every one of us is God or an extension of God. So what you're doing with your direct experiential observation of the world is you're trusting yourself as God, literally. And when you're going to the other belief system, which is our word built world, the belief systems of whatever you're told exists or whatever you're told, which is one step removed from reality, or um, what's, what's real or the real you know, energetic aspect of whatever you're observing, uh, you're told that something, it's like you look in the society now and you go on Facebook or you go and look at the way people are indoctrinated with regards to their health or uh, war or, uh, or crime, or any of these things, you're told what, what's happening, you're told what's true and, and we believe things about it. And it could be one big, for instance, in the last 20 years, uh, according to the FBI, uh, violent crime in the United States has significantly gone down. Now, if you look at the media and what people believe, you think, oh, no, that's not the case. Look at the world today. It's in chaos. Well, it's in less chaos than it's ever been. Isn't that interesting? So that's the difference between observing uh, experientially, where most of us lead pretty calm lives, and listening to the news and then being indoctrinated into a system whose sole purpose is to uh, generate and create uh, domination, control, and money which is just the way it is, it is what it is. It's not bad, it's not wrong, it's just the system that exists. And uh, it's a system that's an illusion because it's temporary and much more temporary than who and what we are. So awareness, why would awareness be of value? Well, in, in the cases that I pointed out, being aware of what's actually happening and what you're being told happening allows you to perceive and live with things as they are. And Personally, I have a preference to live with things as they are rather than what I'm told they are. Now, uh, I can give you examples of where awareness uh, in the uh, work that I do has been very valuable for people. Um, do, you, um, do any of you have any stories in your own lives where awareness has been uh, of value for you? 
right? Can you think of any, can you connect with anything that might uh, say that, okay, well, my direct experiential uh, observation of something helped me get out of a situation where it could have been. When I was in my thirties, um, I was hiking in Colorado and uh, I was so thoroughly enjoying the hike and it wasn't supposed to be a long one. I didn't bring a flashlight or anything with me. And before long, I realized, wait a minute, this is getting darker than I think, than I was thinking. And I decided I better turn around and get back to my tent. And about halfway before I got to my tent, it got pitch black. And uh, I mean, when I say pitch black, I mean, I kept waving my hand in front of my face. I couldn't see anything. And uh, at first I thought I better get on my hands and knees and just crawl because, you know, it was, it was way up in the mountains and I didn't want to go off the trail. Uh, so I started to crawl for a long ways. And then after a while I went, wait a minute, I think I can stand up and walk and feel the trail with my feet. And I did, I stood up and I just started walking normally, even though it was pitch black. And I had no problem at all navigating the trail. And at one point, there was a, I'm gonna use the word awareness because uh, I, it works as well as anything. There was an awareness that said to me, turn left. And I, I thought, this is crazy. I have, you know, I'm up on a trail in Colorado. I could, I could really hurt myself. So I just said, okay, I'm going to head, I'm going to turn left. And I did. And uh, I walked a little ways and all of a sudden there was nothing underneath my feet. I just was falling. And I continued to, I didn't fall that far, but I landed on my back where I had a day pack. And the next thing I know, I started just rolling and uh, I stopped rolling and I got up and I went, well, I have no clue where I am now. So I might as well just find a place to curl up and go to sleep. So I kind of kept walking a little bit. And the next minute I know I tripped and fell flat on my face. And I tripped over the guide wire of my tent. Oh. <laughs> and that's the God on the street. So one, one of the things um, I want to point out about what Bill said that was really good is um, when it comes to awareness, when it comes to awareness, one of the things that's valuable in bringing out our awareness, there are certain things that we can do. I am a big believer uh, and, and doer of being in practice. If you're going to learn something, practice it, because the only thing that brings the result you want is to practice it. And I'm going to give you a couple things to practice uh, before I go. Um, but I call it the crucible. Until we have our consciousness within a crucible, like, like steel, you put it in a pot and you kneel it, make it stronger. Until it's in a crucible or there's a situation like your situation was a crucible that forced your awareness out, uh, it hides. But we just don't use it because we don't need to. We're safe and convenient in the society and there's no reason to develop or grow. And unless you deliberately walk into and force yourself to go into a crucible, uh, the most amazing things that you're missing out on, if you want to look at it that way, or you won't experience, won't happen. And it's usually the crucible that most people in my observation of them uh, try to avoid. That's why there's drug addicts. That's why there's uh, alcoholics, all this other stuff, because they want to avoid that which puts them in a situation where it's uncomfortable. But that discomfort brings amazing abilities that we have already that already exist to the forefront. And I can give you a thousand examples of how that happens. Um, I have no understanding of, uh, of like, you know, how it happens, but uh, that it happened, let me put it that way. Um, source knows how, how, how it happens. I don't, um, I haven't figured anything out really. Uh, I don't know anything for certain, but I observe, you observe things and you see how things happen. So the crucible is, is crucial. And one of the crucibles that we've been put in in this lifetime that most people try to avoid uh, or a lot of people, some people, I don't know, whoever does, 
um, is our, our bodies, our physical reality, our physical material existence, like there's something wrong with it. However, that physical material existence that we have as a body and mind, a spirit, whatever it is, uh, is the crucible we've been put in in order to grow. And it is as uh, sacred and spiritual as anything else. It is God. And you know, God is everywhere. God is all there is. So our bodies and our consciousness, this thing that we have is the key to uh, whatever growth we want to do, or whatever, wherever we want to go, wherever that uh, leads to. For, for me personally, there's only two things I'm interested in, awareness and expansion of it, but divine awareness. And the only thing that expands divine awareness to a great degree is going into or shape, shape shifting into the shape of unconditional love. Unconditional love will bring you everything you ever wanted and needed and beyond. And the shape that humans shift into called unconditional love is the most difficult shape for humans to shift into. Uh, it just is. And yet it's the most rewarding. And one of the ways to shift into that shape is to be around that which most plugs you in, that which has the crucible get the tightest. And when you come through that, what happens is you uh, experience um, more parts of yourself than you have ever known before. You will observe and realize them and more um, abilities of awareness than you ever realized before by putting yourself deliberately into a situation like that. And the Toltec shamans call this the petite tarancho or that which distracts or annoys you to the nth degree, to the degree that you can be with that or have whatever is, be whatever is, whatever it is without judgment is to the degree that your inner peace and unconditional love comes forth. And when you do that, you carry it with you no matter where you go and no matter what you do. And one of the human beings who exemplified this more than anybody else I've ever known was Viktor Frankl, who was in the Auschwitz um, concentration camp. And he wrote those books about being there and how he found such peace and love there. And, and yet, uh, you know, they killed all his family and he was there for, I don't know how many years and tortured and stuff like that. And yet he, he, he came out and realized people were suffering unnecessarily because they did not um, realize their own power. Does that make sense? I'll ask you if it makes sense because I wanna know if I'm communicating clearly. Okay, so uh, the value of awareness. Um, I can give you a, another example of that value of awareness that, uh, and, and uh, one of the things that brings out, or the thing, the number one thing that brings out the, the value of awareness more than anything else is unconditional love. And the one thing that I have discovered as a process that you can practice is called the loving process. And it's a process that uses your body, which is our gateway to the eternal or in the infinite, uh, to access unconditional love. And uh, uh, I might or might not do it here, but it's in the, uh, the book that I have back on the counter there. And if you contact me directly and you don't have the money for it, I will send it to you for, for free. If you have the money, then go ahead and purchase the book. Either way, you're gonna get it if you want it. And it is a process that allows you to access your own unconditional love in a deliberate way. I do it every day, I do it 20 times a day, and it has been mo the most profound and powerful catalyst for awareness and uh, personal power that I've ever experienced. It's called the, the loving process. And uh, there's a second process that I do with people called the census process. Now, you know, when you meditate, the goal in meditation is to become present, to become a present to be in, this, in this present moment, and that's it. And the census process also uses your body and you use it uh, to uh, become present in the present moment. And uh, since it's pretty simple and I can do it fairly quickly, I think I'd like to do it here with you, would you like to do that process? Okay, this is the process and it's very simple. Just sit back in your chair and uh, you can do it with eyes closed, eyes open, whatever you're comfortable doing. Uh, I would recommend for the first few things to do it with eyes closed and you're gonna do this. You're gonna take and you're going to focus on one thing and one thing only. And what you're gonna focus on is taste. Now go into your own mouth and taste. Like experience what it tastes like. What, what is the taste? You can taste things in your mouth that if you're not paying attention to, you won't be uh, aware of. But as soon as you start paying attention to it, you become aware of that. And just go and breathe whatever way you breathe that calms you down and get aware of your taste. Okay, and then when you're complete with doing that after a little while, uh, 
Use your nose, breathe in through your nose and smell what's around you. And if you have your eyes closed, it's a little easier to do this because you're concentrating on that one sense. So just breathe in. What do you smell around you? You smell that tree, you smell the, the carpet, your cologne perhaps. Just breathe in and smell that. And then while you're sitting there, move on to your sense of feeling. What does the seat feel against your butt? What do your arms feel, your back? What does it feel like feeling there? Is your skin hot? Is it cold? Just with your eyes closed, feel your skin. Feel what's around your skin, whatever little air currents you can feel that are touching you. Just feel those. And when you're complete with that, move on to hearing. With your eyes closed, what do you hear around you? Take your hearing and circle it 360 degrees around your body. Do you hear that little fan going? Do you hear a couple of birds outside? Do you hear some wind blowing? Do you hear other people breathing or moving in the room? Do you hear my voice? Just circle away from your body into what's around you and what you can hear. and open up your eyes and just look around in different directions that you wouldn't normally look at when you're sitting in the room and pick out something you had not seen before or not looked at before. There are things in our lives that we can walk by 200 times and not even notice they were there. And then one day we see them and wonder where they came from. And this is something that happens frequently. So if you use this small process, when you lay in bed and do it, it's very effective. And all you do is concentrate on your five senses one at a time and you repeat it and you repeat it and you repeat it and you repeat it over and over again. What happens is your thoughts begin to diminish as if you've been meditating for a long time and you become more present to your own presence as a body or as, a, as an energy or, or in a word, as an awareness. And that has great value because you become aware of things that you weren't aware of before. And it's the things that we're not aware of that trip us up in life. And if we have goals and things like that, it's what we're not aware of that really trips, trips us up. So is that any questions about the senses process? Seems like a simple thing, but so is water. And guess what? It's the most important substance on earth to us and we can't live without it. So the senses process and everything I do is gonna be really simple. But if you repeat it over and over again, the effects of it will be very profound. I guarantee that. And uh, same with the loving process. If you repeat it over and over again, it opens up your heart to an unconditional love that you've never experienced before. Maybe you have. And, uh, but the point of it is, if you have that process in hand, you can deliberately repeat it over and over again and achieve that result rather than those times where it just seemed to happen spontaneously. And being able to deliberately and consciously achieve a result is very important to me at least because I want the result. Um, I wanna uh, diminish my um, attachment to my dark side and uh, without doing anything to it or trying to destroy it or get rid of it or any of that other stuff and then be more light as time goes on. And uh, if I look at the last 30 years, uh, I made great progress. <laughs> it may not look like it right now, but I actually have. <laughs> So uh, that's the important, uh, one of the values of awareness, to be aware of what you're not aware of so that you can uh, use it. And uh, since Bill told a, a little story about that, I'll tell a story about awareness too that is valuable. In, in doing the loving process over and over again, my awareness expanded and it didn't change because as God, your awareness doesn't change. You have the awareness of source or God already. It's whether you're willing to access it or not. So you have all the abilities you will ever have or ever need or could ever imagine or cannot imagine because God imagines a lot more than you do or I do. So you already have it. It's about opening yourself up to what already, already exists. But uh, one day, uh, 
I was driving out to uh, Cherokee to visit some friends of mine, and I was driving in a little uh, green uh, Saturn, and I had the window down, and uh, I was driving about 70 miles an hour uh, or more because um, it was a nice day, and I like to do that. <laughs> and uh, at one point, when I was driving, I, uh, I, I don't know how it happened or what happened or why. It just had this feeling, this um, immense awareness come over me. And uh, my foot flew up uh, uh, automatically without thinking about it. And I slammed on the brakes. And I, I, it's a little confusing to me, but the second I did that, and I mean simultaneously second, a bullet came across the windshield, hit the windshield and went all the way across my windshield that basically would have hit me right here had I not slowed down that fast in that exact moment. And you can't ask me today how or why I did it or, or how that happened, but it did. And that is uh, the bullet that you dodge, literally, uh, when you increase your awareness that you already have or allow it to come to the forefront. And I have no explanation for it, but it happened and you know, it's just the way it is. Um, I'm glad, of course. But, uh, but uh, that is just a small story of uh, many stories I've had with people that I've worked with in seminars who have literally saved their lives or, and, and that's a graphic material, save your life kind of thing. But there are a lot of spiritual uh, advantages uh, and, and to use that term to being more aware. And, uh, and if you look at people who are um, professed uh, spiritualists, um, you often react to them uh, in a, um, uh, less than favorable way, maybe, when they're not being spiritual in your terms or judgment. And, and, and what it really means is they're not being loving. And, and, and until you're completely aware and you allow things to be as they are or the isness of the world to be what it is uh, in our mindset of what spiritual, uh, spirituality means, we won't be there. In other words, the more things that you can allow to be uh, without judgment or criticism to be what they are as they are because they already exist. So you have no determination as to whether they exist or not. They already happen. So all you have the determination to do is give up your judgment of them. And when you do and you allow them to be, it creates space. And space is the place within which awareness occurs. Without that space, no awareness occurs because you're filling it up with your uh, thoughts, beliefs, and judgments of what is. So space is very important. If you think about it, one of the most important things in life is space because without space, well, we wouldn't be here. We're in this space. Well, awareness is no different. So how do you carve out? How do you create that space for awareness to show up? Well, the loving process is one way. And it leads to a realization that when you give up really give up judgment or let things be what they are as they are, then there's no problem. All of a sudden, instead of seeking inner peace, you are inner peace and you bring that to wherever you go. Instead of seeking love, you are love and you bring that to wherever you go or wherever you are, like Viktor Frankl did in Auschwitz. You bring it with you. You're no longer searching for happiness, you are happiness. You're no longer searching for inner peace, you are inner peace. You're no longer searching to be more aware, you are more aware. And it's unconditional love that opens up that possibility within you. Absolutely without question, and that's what the loving process is for. And it uses your body to open up that portal or doorway. Is that, is that pretty clear? I'm not really, I'm, I'm, I'm very enamored of awareness and knowledge, uh, but I'm not really, I don't, I don't want to sell it. You know what I mean? Like if you're interested in it, great. If you're not, well, then, you know, everybody has their place. It's, it's just where they're at. And, and, and in my healing work, that's one of the things that I realized profoundly is that um, there are some people who I've worked with who did not want to heal. And that was fine with me because it's none of my business. If they don't want to heal, you know, it's not my call. And, uh, but they did want something. And, and the one thing that every single human being I've ever worked with, and I've worked with a lot of human beings, from billionaires to presidents to, to um, people in prisons who are on death row and stuff like that. Um, every single one of those people, human beings, wanted the same thing. They wanted, well, two same things, really. The one thing that every single person on the planet wants is A, to feel better than whatever they're feeling in the present moment. Somebody wins the lottery, they want to win it again. Somebody achieves an award, they want another one. Somebody gets a hug, they want one more. 
So the one human characteristic that's common to all of us is every single person wants to feel better than they're feeling in the present moment, in the next moment. And the ways that some people try to achieve that are self-destructive and some of them are very loving. It's, you know, you, you can't judge people for the ways they, they seek things. You just see them as God and the God is always looking to feel better in that present moment. And the second thing that I noticed or observed about people in working in the healing work, because I've had people I worked and done healing work and they passed away within two weeks because they did not want to heal, but they did want something and they wanted it from me. And they wanted to speak into a space of no judgment, of complete unconditional love. And what they wanted to speak was some sentence, some phrase that they wanted the world to know. And they didn't care if 500,000 people knew it. All they wanted was to speak it from their heart into one space that was listening to them for real. And then they could gently and more peaceably, peaceably uh, pass uh, because of that. And they, would, they refused to pass until they spoke that. And, and we all have this inside of us. And generally, uh, I, I mean, it's always, but I say generally because I haven't worked with anybody, everybody on the planet. So I say, generally, it's I am, I am. Some people want to say, uh, want the world to know I am loving. Some people want the world to know I am loyal. Some people want the world to know I am intelligent. Whatever it is, it's an I am thing. And every one of us carry this with us and until we express it to another space of absolute, clear, unconditionally loving, non-judgmental uh, uh, communication, then we won't be heard. And when we're not heard, we manifest all sorts of weird stuff uh, uh, that's detrimental to us, whether it's physical ailments or, or, um, or uh, uh, aggravation or, or all sorts of things. And, and I, I do not in any way whatsoever exclude myself from that schematic. I have what I want to say, and I haven't fully said it either yet. So it's the way it is, but I observe that, uh, yeah, I have that, something to say. Does that, does that make sense? Has anything I've said been of value to you yet or? Yes, no? Okay. And, and to me, the value of anything that I say is to take some of the processes like the census process and use it. Just use it over and over and over again. And people ask me when you do the loving process, they've had the most miraculous results. I've had people cure themselves of breast cancer in two weeks. I've had people cure themselves of a gout and a heart attack in 20 minutes. Um, uh, you know, I mean, a woman called me from a hospital and said I had a heart attack. The doctors want to keep me here. Uh, they want to do some more tests and uh, that all that stuff. She called me up and said, okay, I'll work with you. I started working with her, her energetically over the phone, which I do long distance healings too. And by the time I got to the hospital, she was packing. I said, well, what happened? She goes, the doctor came in, they redid the test. There's nothing wrong, I'm going home. So stuff like that, I suppose it works. So the loving process, how often you do it? I say, do it until you get the result you want and don't stop until you get the result you want. And after you get the result you want, keep on doing it. Because opening yourself up to more and more unconditional love as yourself, as yourself, as your God self is something that's uh, extraordinarily valuable. And if you have a process that allows you to actually do that, then it's like, um, you know, putting a tennis racket in the hands of a tennis player. It's not going to happen without that. And that's the tennis racket. That's the thing you get the racket out of the court with. And uh, it's one other thing I wanted to say. And if there's any questions, just ask. Usually I interact a little more than this and don't just talk steadily, but I can talk for seven or eight hours. So you better watch it and ask them. <clears throat> um, what else I was gonna say something about, um, hmm. so no, no question. Somebody has got a question, I can hear it, but they're not saying it. There are no stupid questions. There are, but in my, in, in, yeah. Well, I've asked them, I know. Um, <clears throat> totally wrong. Okay, so this is the thing. <clears throat> the, the people, when they do forgiveness work, forget something. And this is what they forget, or they never were reminded of. It. And that's what I am. I'm a, I'm a reminder. That's all I am. A reminder. I'll remind you of your own power, of your own godhood. So how do you... Uh, accept something that you know is wrong. First of all, <clears throat> you can't change it, right? Correct? So you, so you can't change it. So let's look at, observe it. You can't change it, okay? You can't make it different. 
and you can't necessarily influence whoever or whatever is doing it to change. The only power you have is the one superhuman power that I've realized that we have is the power of choice and you can choose it. And what you choose is to, uh, to forgive whatever it is for being that way. Now, when people do forgiveness work, this is a the thing they forget. They think that they have to approve of what's happening. They think they have to have it be okay with them. No, you could hate it. You could have it not be something that you ever like or ever change your judgment of it. It doesn't matter. You can still forgive it. And the reason why you can still forgive it is because it is. It already is. It already exists. So you have the ability to forgive it or not. But there it is. It's out there. So where we get stuck in forgiveness work is thinking that once you um, forgive something or somebody that you approve of it or that you, it's okay now. No, it ain't necessarily. So that's fine. Just realize that. Then that allows you the freedom or the space to forgive the transgression, which when you get to a certain point, you realize that really all of people's actions are so unconscious. They never really transgressed against you to begin with. What happens is they were doing their thing and you got in the way somehow. And there was something that your spirit or consciousness wanted out of that or, or whether that's true or not, doesn't matter. My practice is if it happened <clears throat> and it's wrong and I don't like it and I got to forgive it and I got to go through all this work, I'll be darned if I'm not going to get some value out of that. I'm going to make that something that's going to be empowering for me no matter what. So if somebody is that way and they did that and, I, and I'm being a victim about it and they did it to me, I'm going to use that to pry myself away from the victimhood racket, which is immensely pervasive in this society, in our legal system and our, our media, the whole thing, oh, everybody's a victim. Uh, no, but anyway, that is very uh, destructive to our spirit, uh, not our spirit, to our um, consciousness. Uh, spirit, nothing destroys spirit. So, it, so you can forgive it and not like it. You can forgive it and hate it doesn't matter, but forgive it is for you. So you can do that on your end and it won't change anything necessarily as to what happened out there at all, or it will. But what it changes in you is the energy that you have attached to not forgiving it and it frees your energy up. And one of the greatest Toltec shamanic practices I do is the freeing of energy or losing of self-importance. Because when I get righteous about some wrong that somebody did to me, it's all about self-importance. You shouldn't have done that. That shouldn't happen. Well, the truth is it did happen. Whether I care whether it should or shouldn't, whether I like it or not, it did happen. It's already happened. So am I going to suffer with it and continually use my energy to attach myself to something I don't like? That's insanity. And, you know, I'm as insane as everybody else, but, but that is insanity. So did that clarify any for you? Or? Yes. I'm just reminding you what you already know. It can. You are. Yeah, and you know what? I, I agree with you. There's only one acceptance that I accept, and, that the, and that's the acceptance of that it is. It just is. I got it. That picture's on the wall. That is. Accept it or not, I accept that it's there. It is. That's the only acceptance I do. I don't accept like, oh, it's okay. I don't do that. It's not okay. You know, war is not okay with me. Sorry. It may be a bigger picture that Buddha and Jesus knew, but, um, and, and I've seen, but in my human form, uh, war isn't cool. You know, I, I'm retired from the military. You know, I have a disability. You know, uh, you know, you don't, can't see it, but they took out 10 pounds of my body. So, you know, was that okay? No, it's not okay with me. I, war is not kind. Well, I don't know. I don't even know that. All I know is everything is as it is. Should it be that way? I don't really know. It's not my call. It, not my call. 
Did, did, did that help clarify it? Because uh, and there's a thing I do called the four F forgiveness process. You you um, forgive. You forget about it after you forgive. You forego any retaliation. So forgive, forget, forgo, and then form a new plan. A new plan is to release my energy from whatever it is I can't forgive. Because uh, every uh, true uh, mystic, like you know Jesus or Buddha or any other guys or women, um, knew that their internal state was more important than whatever was happening in the world. And when your internal state shifts, the world changes for you. I don't know how that works. That's not my call. That's the way God made it. Is that, is that clarified a little? And, and, and I can feel that most people think, that, oh, I got to like it if I accept it. Well, you don't have to accept it. I don't accept that painting, but I accept that it is. There it is. There it is. What I'm about to say is, I really believe that something good comes out of something bad, always. I'm a true believer in something good will always come out of something bad, mm -hmm. no matter how bad. Mm -hmm. That something will a change in consciousness or a change in the world or something, something will rise up because God always has a witness, one witness somewhere. Someone will be a witness to that. Yeah, whatever happens, use it and use it for your good. And then, and then, and, and, and both of those, absolutely. And, and that's a, absolutely, everybody's own belief is completely valid, completely valid. So I never invalidate anybody's belief. And sometime you might get to a place where you realize the whole good and bad paradigm doesn't even exist. It just is. It just is. Right, wrong, good or bad, you know, Buddha said this, Jesus said this, but when you experience that, that good or bad paradigm doesn't exist. It's like, it frees you. And I'm definitely into freedom. What it frees you to do is be more aware and expansive in unconditional love. That's, that's it. That's it. You know, to ever expand in divine love and divine awareness. That's my total purpose and goal in life now. I couldn't care less about anything else. And I, you know, my ego cares about crap, but I, the spirit doesn't. Ever expand in divine love and divine awareness. Because when you expand in divine love, you expand in divine awareness, and there is no wrong. There's only God. Now, how does that play out? I don't know. I haven't got it figured out, but that part I know is absolutely accurate. And, and I'm going to... I just wanted to share something. And, and it's kind of hard to sit, but I'll stay here. Um, I just wanted to share something. Um, where is God? Everywhere. So where is God? Okay. So sitting in your seat, uh, are you God? You are God, right? Okay. So you're sitting in your seat and you're God and you know this. You know, this is accurate. You know, it's true. You can feel it. So look at yourself. Look at yourself as you sit there with your eyes. Look at yourself. Can you do it? No, you can't do it. You cannot look at yourself sitting there. So then how do you get to experience God? How are you going to experience God? How can you do that? There's only one way to experience God. And I got this so profoundly one day, it kind of made me mad because I realized I've been doing it wrong for so long. Um, how do you experience God? There's only one way to experience God. One way. If I can't see God over there in that chair, I will never see God. If I can't see God over there in that chair, I will never see God because I can't see myself. If I don't see God over in that chair, I will never see God, never. Or that chair, or that chair, or that chair, or that chair, or that chair. I don't see God there, I will never experience God. Oh boy, that's a hard one. But they did something wrong. And the interesting thing about them doing something wrong is when you put yourself in a crucible uh, that powerful, you realize all the things that you think other people do wrong are things in yourself that you cannot love and accept. And, and um, I wasn't going to say anything about this, but I'll say it anyway, because 
it was a tremendous crucible. I deliberately got into a relationship with a woman one time who was an alcoholic, a sex addict, a drug addict, uh, extremely controlling, um, ADHD, uh, um, uh, OCD, and, and uh, on the autistic scale, and extremely self-destructive. And the only reason I did it was she asked me if, she would, if I would help her with her sobriety to become sober. I thought about it for a little while and said, okay, you asked, you were willing, you want to do that? We'll do that. So I, I did that. And out of being with her and seeing so many things that I detested in other people, I realized how much of it was a mirror for my own behavior and how much of it existed in me. I was an addict too, but I wasn't addicted to substances. I was addicted to stress because I grew up in a ghetto. And for the first 17 years of my life, I was continually assaulted physically, mentally, spiritually, beaten and left for dead more than once. I was addicted to stress because that was my life for the first 17 years I was growing up. And that's all I knew. And being with her, I realized why I picked her because it was so stressful. And I was getting what I always had and it was a relief because it was convenient and boy, I got a lot of it. So it was really good for me. Something I knew and it was familiar. So walking out of the familiar is what gives you the ability to anneal yourself in the crucible, being willing to be uncomfortable. And being in that relationship was extremely uncomfortable because I kept on looking at myself, not her. I would look at her too, but I would look at myself and everything that was happening with me and all my addictions and all how I was controlling and how I was not uh, giving up my self-importance. But, but the one beauty of that particular relationship was that I did it deliberately. I purposely put myself in that crucible to learn more about myself than I'd ever learned before and it worked. And everything that I detested in her, I realized in some degree or some way it existed inside of me. And until I dealt with that, uh, well, I would never let go of that stuff because it never came to my consciousness before of how much I was that way. And, and, and the more you work on yourself, you know, like that, you realize, oh, well, there's a little more to go, oh, that more to go, a little more to go. So that's why I do the loving process all the time because you don't need to work on yourself anymore once you're in unconditional love or in that state of being. That's the ultimate state of being, ultimate state of awareness, unconditional love, period. That's God. So you can't see God until you see God in other people. And you can't see God in other people until you know who and what you are and what you're making wrong in other people that already exist inside of you. And once you unconditionally love yourself through the loving process and love those things about yourself, you cannot love them in other people. You'll never see God. And that is the key to seeing God in a nutshell. And you had a question? Um, yeah, I'm still formulating it, so forgive me. <laughs> um, can you hear me with my yeah. mask on? Uh, Hi, soft voice. So, <laughs> um, could you speak a little bit more specifically about? So, we have the, the global situation, let's say, um, Pachamama, um, all the species becoming extinct, and the air and water we breathe, um, you know, being threatened. Uh, and and that we're all related um, in the mother body, the earth body. Um, and you've been talking about um, all the ways to become embodied. That awareness is extremely embodied, that we're gonna start with our senses. Um, so how do we, if all of our senses are, as equally threatened as, let's say, those species becoming extinct, how do we continue our awareness through embodiment when there's so much destruction going on in the in the global sense right now? Okay, um, we're in Auschwitz. Celebrate it. Here's the thing. Let me give you a bit of perspective on that. Because, you know, I go through the same stuff about, you know, I want this planet to exist because I'm so self-important. I think my existence is so wonderful that I want it to continue. And if we screw up the planet, I won't be able to continue. That's self-importance rather than looking at it from a different perspective. Uh, one of the perspectives is, um, did you know that before man showed up on Earth, 99% of the species on Earth had already gone extinct 
because of cataclysmic, you know, that stuff, meteors and stuff, meteors and stuff like that. Okay, so 99% of the species have already gone extinct before man shows up. So we're dealing with 1% now, and we think it's really important. And to the species, it certainly is. But in the grand scheme of things, I have a feeling that it's not as important as we think, we think it is. And the thing about consciousness is when you shift your consciousness into unconditional love, others around you will do so as well. And when they do, then the effect that they have on the planet will, um, negative effect will diminish. It, it, you know, it, I mean, you say if, if everybody was in a state of unconditional love, none of these problems would exist. Well, who's going to start? We have to start. I have to start with me. And it's not that the whole um, pollution, you know, Pacamama and stuff, it's not, it's not that that's distressing to anybody who's observant, but it's also um, on a geological time scale. And our lives, if you compare them, it's totally meaningless because our lives are so short compared to the geology and geology. The earth doesn't care, the earth will recover. The earth is gonna be fine. What we're really worried about is, is it's gonna be okay for us to live here. So that's kind of a self-importance in and of itself. And the one Toltec shamanic practice that I make my best attempt to do is to uh, uh, gain energy. And one of the biggest energy gains you can possibly conserve energy uh, because we have a, a sealed energy envelope and we use our energy for so many different things that it gets used up, including worrying about the earth and stuff like that, which the earth doesn't need us to worry about it. It's fine in and of itself. We're not fine. Um, is losing self-importance. That's the number one practice. You lose self-importance. And if you look at our concern for the earth, it's really, for most people, it really isn't about the earth. It's about, oh, are we going to be able to live here? Are we going to be able to survive? And I don't know, either we will or we won't, but the earth doesn't care. It'll be fine, no matter what choices we make. You know, a few hundred thousand, a few million geological years after we're gone, the earth will be a huge jungle again. Well, well what did we do? Nothing. So what we're really concerned about there is, is can we live here? Well, um, when you get into the state of being an unconditional love and start shifting people around you and, and, and you realize uh, they're starting to do things as you're starting to do things to support the earth, then you know, that's all you can do. It's like Mother Teresa said, when somebody came up to her, said, how can I change the world? And she said, well, see that beggar there who's got a wound and injury, dress it and take care of him. No, no, I wanna affect millions of people. I wanna, well, you change the world by picking up the first person in front of you, that's what you do. So what's the first consciousness you have in front of you? It's your own. So you, you work on that, that's all you can do. And that really is all you can do, but that's not to say that's not hugely profound. It is, because when your consciousness shifts, people have said it shifts a lot of other people's consciousness around you. And I don't know, the, the numbers have been thrown out about that. You know, Wayne Dyer used to say, if your consciousness shifts, 750,000 other people's consciousness shifts. I don't know where he got that number, but it sounds good to me. But, but I do know that when your consciousness shifts, other people around you's consciousness shifts, and that's an important thing to me. Yes. Not like boundaries in relationship, is that what they're saying? I would imagine so, yeah. Well, that's kind of a sophisticated conversation, but I'll say this about that, that uh, when I was with that person and I was continually um, um, reacting to everything that she did, I was thinking with a victim mindset, my boundaries were being crossed. Boundaries were being crossed until one day, uh, um, she was standing by the dryer screaming at me for, for something. Uh, I had tried to help her out with something and whatever you tried to help her out, she used to get really pissed off. Like, okay, I, I won't say a word. Uh, I, I got it. I really got that um, what she was doing had nothing to do with me and that she wasn't crossing any of my boundaries. She was crossing her own boundaries. And that, that, that thing that was happening over there, I could let affect me and let it in as if it had something to do with me. So therefore, you know, Bonnery gets crossed, it's transgressed, she did something wrong, I'm mad at her, I'm gonna get her back, I did it, all that other stuff. Or I could see that what was happening outside of myself had nothing to do with me at all, at all. 
And it was very profound realizing that. I realized, man, I've been making crap up about people all my life. You know, you did that to me. Look what you said. You know, the righteousness, the self-importance, all that other stuff. And it, it's in this society, in our legal system, in our educational system, in the military, in our government, we are, in our media, totally immersed in the victim racket. And it's a racket. You did something to me. And it's not that people don't do stuff. I'm not unaware of the, the crap that people do that, that hurt people. But it's that 99.9, 100% of the time, you're actually not the victim. So with boundaries, if you realize that you only allow somebody to cross your boundaries when you say they did. And if you say they don't, and I'm not saying if you're with somebody who's physically abusive, get out, don't stay with them. But I'm saying they'll be that way to the next person it has nothing to do with you. And, and the, this is the, I just remember the key point to that that I realize is the buttons in her were installed years before I got there. And that what I did push the button had nothing to do with my intent. My intent was to be loving and helpful. And yet this huge reaction, well, it didn't make sense to me until I realized she, wanted her buttons to get pushed because she wanted to heal from that stuff. That's why she kept on getting those buttons pushed. And she used to drink to keep from having them touched. But the key point there was that those buttons in another person are there. They have nothing to do with you. You didn't install them. You're not responsible for them. You're not even responsible for their reaction. I used to apologize all the time. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was no longer sorry. I realized, wait a minute. It so didn't have anything to do with me. I'm not even sorry. And I would never push that button again if there was some way I could realize what I was doing would do that. That's not the kind of person I am. But you know what? It didn't matter what I did next. It was going to push another button. Didn't matter. Didn't matter what I did. No matter how kind or compassionate or loving I was, it was still going to push a button because they had been installed before I got there. There were thousands of them and they were just going to happen. I hope that helped. Well, I never know the effect that what I say has on people until they respond with, oh yeah, okay, I'll use that. And I want people to use what I say because it's been useful for me at least. And if, and, and if it's been useful for me, I know it's useful to you because one thing I learned in working with thousands and thousands of people, whatever we resonate with that's a use for us spiritually or, or, um, or for consciousness or awareness, Everybody's the same. It'll be useful for them too. Now, whether they're willing to pick it up and use it as a tool or not remains to be seen. But it is useful if it's useful for you. That's why sharing is so important. You know, and one of the most profound things I ever did was in a seminar one time, and there was 300 people in the room, and one guy stood up and he started speaking, and I realized that was me. He was speaking. And then the, the, the real profound thing was, the secondary profound thing, was that he was the only one in the room when he was speaking who didn't realize what he was doing. He was being defensive and all 300 other people got it, but he didn't. And when he sat down and somebody else stood up, then he was saying, you know, like, oh, they were wrong or this wasn't good. Or, or, or. And then everybody in the room got it, but, but, but she didn't. And I realized that's what we do all the time. But this thing is, uh, we do it all the time. We. Our blind, we have a blind spot a tractor trailer truck could drive through. And that's the necessity of this God sitting out there because you can see my blind spot and I cannot. And that's, that's the value of the God out there. And I have that same tractor truck blind spot, only it looks different than me, but it's still you know, just as big. And when the God out there sees the God in you, you see that blind spot, you point it out and you unconditionally love it and then everybody heals. And you don't have to, this isn't have to thing. It's just observing, that's what happens. This is the way it works. You don't have to do any of this. You don't have to like anything. You don't have to forgive them. However, it frees you up when you do. You don't, it's not a requirement in life to forgive anybody. However, when you do, your energy is freed up for your own inner peace and your own unconditional love for yourself and your ability to see God as other people, which they are. But they're wearing different clothes than I am. How could they be God? Well, they still are. I don't care if you don't like those pants. I wasn't looking at you, Bill. Well, see, too much training.
Yes. You've got some available in the back. I do have it in the back and also online on the uh, www.acourseinshamanism.com. Okay. The book's on there as a PDF file that you can order. And there's a contact form. Any problem with ordering it, contact me and we'll straighten it out because I've had some problems with the website lately and I'm not computer literate and don't want to be. But uh, it's available on the website. And excerpts are available. Well, or maybe that one is uh, the book. I think one, the book one is available on the website and I'm in the process of putting Be Bad, Be Good on the website. Uh, but if not, it's on Amazon. It's somewhere okay. if, if you look it up. Yeah, my website needs a little work. I, I have not done it because I've been busy working on another book. Sure. But, but I like the thing about anything I said today is that I, I realized that until I see God as you, then I will never see God. It's like, whoa, that was really profound for me. You know, so, you know I can't see myself. I can't see my own eyeballs. But on, on a, a deep level, you feel that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Wonderful.